the prayer of the day. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. O oh God, your ears are always open to the prayers of your servants. Open our hearts and minds to you, that we may live in harmony with your will and receive the gifts of your spirit through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the reading. I apologize to Jen, I read that wrong. She didn't type it wrong. Our first lesson this morning is the Old Testament lesson from 2 Kings 4, 42 to 44. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God 20 loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe grain, along with some heads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, give it to the people to eat. For this is what the Lord says, they will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate, and they had some left over, according to the word of God. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading is the epistle, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, and that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the gospel reading. Our gospel this morning is from John chapter 6, verses 1 to 21. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the hillside and sat down with the disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have even a bite. Another of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over from those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him a king by force, withdrew again into the hills by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, 
walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The Gospel of the Lord. Be to God. You may be seated. When Jesus walked our earth in his human body, people knew he was right there with them, even if they did not always accept that he was God. In the first part of the gospel today, he performed that miracle of feeding thousands with the five barley loaves and two small fish. We hear people talk about having a mountaintop experience, a time when someone feels really close to God. The disciples and those thousands surely should have felt a mountaintop feeling. But Jesus did not stay on that hillside, and the people had to return to their regular lives. We come here to worship and hopefully feel close to God. But we don't stay here all week. We return to our regular lives. It is easy to say, oh yes, I believe there is a God, but it is an entirely different matter to believe and live your life as if God is with you all the time. Some people are trying to live their ordinary day-by-day -day lives without God. They are embarrassed by the presence of God. One thing that shows this is how some people act in the presence of a minister. Because he or she represents the church and God, a minister's presence often embarrasses some people. They just can't act normal around them. One minister told me what happens when he goes to a social function where he doesn't know very many people. After a while, someone talking says, oh, what do you do for a living? And then it happens. Oh, you're a minister? From that time on, he said, I can't find anyone who swears anymore, and all of the off-color references that I heard before disappear. Some are almost embarrassed by my presence. He ended by saying, think how they would feel if God himself were present. Think about it. What would you say to God? Would you discuss the weather, the house you bought or are fixing up, the elections and taxes, the latest movie or the latest TV show you watched, the baseball standings? Mom and I would probably do that. <laughs> we would really have to watch what we said if we thought of God being right there in front of us listening all the time. It would be awkward for a lot of people to converse with God. To be in the presence of God would make a lot of people change their ways, their dress, their thinking, their habits, how they spend their money. So because God's presence would embarrass people, many just assume he's not there. They go about their merry way doing just what they want in their lives and not giving God another thought. But everyone should realize and confess with their lives that every minute God is right here with us. St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in that second reading, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. St. Paul knew that Jesus, if we will let him in, will dwell in our hearts, and we will know that he is always present. One of my favorite pictures is the one of Jesus knocking on the door. He's always present, ready to enter to be part of our lives. I saved a story from an old magazine, like I do. It was written by David L. Miller of our church. He wrote about the day that three-year-old Kaylee came to his office, trailing her mother, who was carrying her new baby brother. The whole office gathered around, ooing and aahing for that new baby, while Kaylee, a beautiful, vivacious child, with piercing dark eyes, 
folded her arms and frowned, pushed aside by this interloper who had entered her world where she had been the center. Getting on my knees, I opened my arms. She hesitated. Then she stepped into my embrace, put her arms around my neck, and hugged me. Seldom did I feel so honored. She leaned back in my arms and began chatting happily, her world restored. I don't recall what she said. I was too busy fighting off tears. Holding her, I knew beyond a doubt that I am loved and delighted in the same way I was delighted in holding her. I felt joy and energy come back from her little body and saw it in those oh so serious eyes. And I experienced the immense pleasure my Lord takes in loving me so that I too may become more alive than I usually am. Holding Kaylee became a surprising sacrament of, the, of an incomprehensible mercy. Young Kaylee could have refused my open arms, but she responded, and realized in some elemental way that she was just as precious and loved as ever. What if we lived all of life that way? What if we met each challenge or anxiety, whether working our jobs, taking on a tough situation, living with conflict, facing the loss of a loved one over our own health, with the awareness that the loving mystery we call God delights in blessing us? What if we faced all situations with the awareness that no matter what happens, we came from eternity and are moving toward eternity, drawn by a love that transcends our ability to imagine? What if we truly felt that in life and death we are the Lord's? We would feel safe, even in the most trying circumstances and death's terror, we would know that we rest in God's arms. This knowledge would rip from our hearts the loneliness that haunts us, for we would know that we are never alone. Our spirits would no longer be narrow, pessimistic, suspicious, but they would be open, expansive, soaring, and confident. We would know that we are intimately connected to the creative, loving mercy from which comes, from which the cosmos springs, excuse me. This is the life God offers us through our brother and Lord Jesus. The arms of God are always open, but will we step into that embrace? At the end of the gospel reading for today, the disciples were in a frightening situation. They were in their boat in a storm on the sea. They were trying to row the boat to safety when they saw Jesus walking on the water coming to their boat. John writes that at first they were terrified to see someone on the water coming toward them. But when Jesus said, It is I, don't be afraid, they were glad to have him join them in the boat. They were glad that Jesus was with them. Excuse me. When we are hurting, we often long for a word of comfort. We long to hear from God. In times of pain, God sometimes speaks to us clearly through the Bible or the sacraments, or people, our loved ones, or friends. Other times, however, it seems that God has nothing to say. We may wonder, does God still love us? Yet many times, God does not need to speak a single word. In those times, God is sitting with us, silently holding our hands. God comforts us and wipes away our tears. Although we may not hear God's voice in all those times, Remember, God never leaves us, not for a moment. Even when we are not aware of it, God remains constantly by our side. I pray that you always believe and sense that God is with you and that you can have the confidence that he will be present in your eternal future. Amen. We sing our hymn. Um.